So I, I think of the cornerstone of the global nuclear regime, uh, non-proliferation regime, as the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. That was the treaty um, that was negotiated largely by the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the 1960s, um, and then with input from allies and other states, um, the treaty was finalized in 1968 and it came into force in 1970. And so that is the treaty that says that there are five official nuclear weapon states. That's the US, uh, the Soviet Union and now Russia, China, Great Britain and France. Um, and so those were the countries that had detonated a nuclear weapon by um, January 1st, 1967. And so they were sort of grandfathered in as official nuclear weapon states and then any other states that wanted to join had to join as non-nuclear weapon states. Um, what do they get for this, this sort of bargain? Um, according to the MPT, they get access to peaceful nuclear technology. So there's lots of other things to do with nuclear technology besides weapons. So there's medical and agricultural uses, and of course there's energy generation. Uh, in addition to that, all the states in Article 6 committed to pursue negotiations towards eventual nuclear disarmament and general disarmament. So there is this promise implicit in the treaty that all of the parties, including the five nuclear weapon states, will eventually um, to pursue disarmament. Uh, so that's the treaty. Countries that join have to conclude safeguards agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, you hear about them as sort of the nuclear watchdog. They're located in Vienna, Austria, and they will send inspectors around the world to ensure that countries are not using the nuclear material that they have um, for weapons purposes, to make sure it's a, they account for it, um, and that sort of all the material is accounted for, so it's not you know in the back somehow being uh, diverted for nuclear weapons. And so those safeguards, the IAEA and the MPT, I think of sort of the the center. Some people say cornerstone, keystone, um, but you get the idea. It's that they are at the center. And then there's a lot of different other agreements, norms, and activities that bolster the goals of the MPT. So there's agreements related to nuclear security, there's agreements related to nuclear testing, um, but I, I see kind of the MPT as being at the center of all of those. So as I said, it entered into force in 1970 and slowly over time, more and more um, states or countries joined. In the early 70s, it was actually thought that the MPT was going to be a failure. People did not think it was gonna succeed. They thought more countries were gonna develop nuclear weapons. Um, if you look back at old declassified documents or documents from the time, there is this real sense of pessimism about what the MPT could do. And so I think when we think now, all but five states in the international system are part of the treaty, um, you see that it really has come a long way. And so the members of the MPT meet every five years in what they call review conferences, or the shorthand is RevCon. Um, and so they had one in 75 and 80 and 85, and sometimes they've been su successful, sometimes not. Um, the measure that's typically used for success for these meetings is if they're able to come up with a consensus document that all the members agree to. Some people say that shouldn't be our, our standard of what's successful. Um, but I think one thing that's amazing about the MPT is it has been able to accrue more and more members over time and they've been able to in improve the safeguards agreement. So I mentioned before that IAEA inspectors are able to go around and check um, the nuclear holdings or the material holdings of countries. Um, it was clear uh, in the 1990s that that agreement that had been established in 1971 was not sufficient. And why did they know that? That is because after the Gulf War with Iraq, remember that's the war when Iraq uh, went into Kuwait and tried to take over their oil fields, and then the U.S. and a coalition of forces went in in the Gulf War to try to repel uh, Saddam Hussein's forces back. After that, the soldiers there uh, found out um, and inspectors there found out that Iraq had a secret nuclear weapons program. And they had had this secret program even though those international inspectors had been visiting every year for 10 years. Um, and so the international community came together and said, we need, we need a better safeguards agreement. And they had established something called the Model Additional Protocol. It was finalized by 1997. And that gives these international inspectors a lot more leeway in terms of going around in states. They can do short-term inspections. It's supposed to um, speed up their visa processes so they can get in countries quicker. Um, and so far, as, as far as we know, no country has cheated on the MPT while having concluded this additional safeguards agreement. 
And so I tell you that about the additional protocol, because one thing that I think is also interesting about the MPT is that as a regime, it has been able to adapt when weaknesses have become apparent. And so there's a number of different additional treaties or initiatives or organizations that have come about when um, it's become clear that there are loopholes or weaknesses in that ad original agreement. Um, and of course, we know that the treaty has lasted through both a bipolar period in the Cold War and then after um, the Soviet Union um, collapsed, the treaty has continued. So I, I see it as one of the most successful um, examples of international agreement and international cooperation. So there are currently five states outside of the MPT. South Sudan is not a member and South Sudan is the newest state in the international system. Uh, there's a lot going on there, but I would assume that at some point they, they will join and I'm sure there's um, diplomats from different countries trying to engage on getting them to join. So let's put them on one side. Then there's North Korea, the only country that has joined and then withdrawn from the MPT. So they would announce their withdrawal uh, in 2003 and they have gone on, as you know, to develop nuclear weapons, to test nuclear weapons. So imagining, I mean, that is just a hard nut to crack, right? Imagining how they are gonna come back into compliance, how they would consider giving up their nuclear weapons program. Um, so that's another country. So then the other three, India, Pakistan, and Israel, are all countries that have nuclear weapons programs. Um, I, I guess with Israel, we say allegedly has a nuclear weapons program um, uh, that never joined. And because the treaty text says that you had to explode a nuclear device before January 1st, 1967, and those countries had not, they just legally are, cannot be nuclear weapons states in the MPT. It would be very difficult to amend the MPT. I, I, I tend to think that's unlikely, but I think what the international community needs to do is to try to bring those countries more into other norms uh, of the non-proliferation regime. Um, I think the US, you know, the US, uh, a lot of people in the international community have tried to work towards a treaty that would cut off fissile material, the main ingredient in nuclear weapons, to say that countries can no longer um, develop highly enriched uranium or plutonium. And Pakistan um, has been one of the countries that's, that's kind of stymied that effort internationally. So I think a lot of engagement needs to take place, both India and Pakistan. And I mean, hopefully we get to a place where those two countries have some kind of, I mean, if they haven't joined kind of the global non-proliferation regime, at least has arms control or transparency measures, or some kind of confidence building measures um, between those two countries. Because I think most Analysts and scholars, when they think of where a nuclear exchange, you know, it's, it's an unlikely event, but where it would be more likely to happen than other places, I think they're worried about India, Pakistan. So that's another kind of broader challenge to the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Oh, Iran, of course. Okay, so Iran is a member of the MPT, and it was because Iran was a member of the MPT that international inspectors were able to go and ask questions, and when their questions weren't sufficiently uh, answered uh, when there was some concern about what Iran had been doing there um, in terms of a nuclear weapons program. The inspectors, um, they were referred by the International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors to the UN Security Council. And so that was in the early 2000s. That led to, I think, six rounds of sanctions against Iran and eventually led in the Obama administration to negotiating uh, the JCPOA, which is popularly known as the Iran nuclear deal. The Trump administration withdrew uh, from the deal. Um, I want to say that was in May of 2018. Is that right? The U.S. With, was one of the negotiating partners, uh, with, withdrew from the deal. And so now I think it's really unclear what's going to happen. Um, I think Vice President Biden has said is if he's elected, he would try to re-engage. But I think it's unclear if um, Tehran would want to re-engage with the U.S. on this issue. They have, they have been very careful in walking back their commitments in that deal. So they waited almost a year um, before they started doing things in 2019 that went against the deal. Um, and so they're slowly in increasing the amount of uh, enriched uranium they have. Um, what I think is, is, is really concerning is they have floated, at least in national media, there's been reports of people in the government in Iran saying that they should leave the MPT. I think that would be really dangerous for them. Um, I think that would be much worse. And right now they're, they're, they're a more sympathetic figure for staying in the deal while the US left. 
Um, and so I think that would be a strategic mistake. But just the fact that countries are even talking and comfortable talking about withdrawing it, it seems problematic to me. And of course, we have Saudi Arabia, um, whose leaders have said that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, they will get nuclear weapons. And then you think about proliferation cascade. So what happens with Iran, I think, is really important to the future of the broader regime. start by saying all of the countries that are involved in the NPT gain something from being in the treaty, whether it's because they want peaceful nuclear technology and the IAEA, those international inspectors, help them get it, or because it solves a security dilemma. So if, if there is a credible, if you see the NPT as a credible way for your neighbors to commit to you that they are not going to proliferate and develop nuclear weapons, um, then that Right, that is a benefit. And so I think sometimes that benefit gets overlooked when we see this debate between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states that the nuclear weapon states haven't done enough to disarm um, or the treaty's in trouble to remember that all, all, all states benefit somewhat from the MPT. But what I argue is that the US um, and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, these great powers, these superpowers, that they benefit dis disproportionately to other states they have the greatest strategic interest in pre preventing states from proliferating. So think about the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. These are, these are power, militarily powerful states that have interests all over the globe, right? They wanna be able to go into different countries for better or for worse. And so if other countries, if a bunch of other smaller countries have nuclear weapons, they could be deterred from acting in certain, um, to fulfill their interests. They are also at risk of being brought into uh, a nuclear war if one of their allies, for example, um, gets involved in a crisis. So there's a lot of strategic reasons why the U.S. and the Soviet Union pursued the MPT in the first place. And so if, if you're with me there that there's this greater strategic interest for the, for the U.S. and the Soviet Union, um, then I think my other, the other part of my argument makes sense, which is that each time a new nonproliferation agreement or initiative has come about, it has usually been the United States that has been the key architect and promoter of that new regime, of that new agreement, and that the U.S. usually has to be involved in um, trying to persuade other states to join. And so in my research, I found that most of the time states don't join until the U.S. puts some level of pressure. And that's not to say that those states don't have agency. That's not to say that those states don't also care about nonproliferation, but just they don't care as much as the hegemonic power, which is now the United States. And so I see the sustainment of this regime over 50 years. Um, I think the most important factor to that sustainment has been the role that the US has played, and to a lesser extent, the Soviet Union. I, I, I make the argument in my work that the, the US has been primary. This is work that I've done kind of looking at archives, looking at um, declassified cables, thinking about the diplomacy that goes on between the U.S. and other countries. And so what we see usually is that the first thing that the U.S. does um, is send, uh, um, say, send a cable to its own embassy in the country and tells its diplomats there, we want you to emphasize um, to the government, the foreign government there, that this is important. The U.S. government will also send a demarche. So a demarche is something, a message that they send that is about something that they want another country to do or to highlight a, a policy priority. So they'll send demarches. Uh, in my reading, there's times where the U.S. really cares about something and countries complain about just how many demarches they did receive from the U.S. I think sometimes we can, it's a little overkill, but um, when the U.S. wants something, you know, it's going to make the other countries know that it wants that. Um, there's, of course, bilateral and multilateral meetings. Sometimes at multilateral meetings where maybe foreign ministers or other representatives of government are going to come together, the U.S. will send representatives to try to put language in the final consensus documents of those meetings. So often those meetings end and they have some document that they, they publicize to the international community. And in that document, the U.S. will have persuaded them to put something in there about the importance of, say, concluding that additional protocol safeguards agreement I mentioned earlier. Um, and so they can do that. And from, from my interviews, I found that, that that language has actually helped because it's sometimes, because a country has, has committed to putting that consensus language there, even if they haven't joined, then US diplomats will go back later and say, oh, remember you signed on to this. Um, 
And it's almost like a foot in a door, the, a foot in a door effect. You make, get someone to make a small commitment and hopefully they make a larger one later. Um, and so that's, that's worked. And sometimes they try to set deadlines. Um, I also find that when the, if, if these kind of what I call low cost diplomacy um, tactics don't work, that the U.S. might move on to what I call high cost diplomacy. So having the leader, uh, having the secretary of state, the vice president or the president send a message to that, the heads of the foreign government can sometimes um, have an effect. And that's, I think that's because these are very busy people with many priorities. And if they're taking the time um, to have their name be attached to a message to say a, a foreign president or prime minister or leader, um, then I think that sends an important signal that this really matters to the U.S. And I think leaders might think twice about um, going against that request. And that's in part because as a hegemonic power, the U.S. does have um, a lot of influence in states. The U.S. gives a lot of aid or you know military assistance. And so there are lots of levers that the U.S. has to try to change the calculus of other countries. And so when the president is saying, please join this agreement, um, you can imagine in the minds of that foreign leader that they're thinking, oh, is, would it be wise if I go against this? And sometimes, sometimes they do. I'm not saying that everyone always complies with the U.S., but I think there's a real calculation. And then we get to kind of things like inducements and coercion, like making threats. Um, and this is rare in this particular area. It's not rare with proliferation in general, but it's rare with the regime, with the non-proliferation regime. But for example, in 1995, the membership of the MPT had to decide on the future of the treaty. The original text only put the treaty forward for 25 years because a lot of countries weren't willing to give up their um, their right to, to develop nuclear weapons for all time in perpetuity. They wanted to make this a time-bound treaty. And so the U.S. and the Soviet Union had to compromise to that 25-year term limit. And because the treaty entered into force in 1970, that decision point came in 1995. It was a time when they were already having their every five-year review conference. So this became the 1995 Review and Extension Conference. And so at that conference, the U.S. was pushing for unconditional indefinite extension. The U.S. wasn't interested in messing around with five-year terms, 25-year terms, 15-year terms, some of the things that other states wanted. They wanted this treaty to last um, indefinitely. And so we do see in that particular case, because it was time bound and there was a time crunch and there was a real concern about the future of the treaty, that we did, we do see examples there of the U.S. threatening some states. Um, and we see states that changed their position on indefinite extension during the meeting after getting calls from their capital because their capital had received a call from Washington. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to emphasize, overemphasize the kind of coercive mechanisms because I do think that Sometimes when we emphasize those, it undermines the value that the treaty does have to all states. And it also, I think, hurts le the legitimacy of the treaty in some ways, right? If it has to look like a state won't join unless there's some kind of quid pro quo, um, then it suggests that state doesn't see value other than the benefits or the payment that they're going to receive. And yet I do think countries see the value, but sometimes because the U.S. cares more, countries know that they might be able to get something. Um, and so even though maybe the US government wouldn't necessarily want to um, advertise those things, I think some of those things did happen at that time. Um, in interviews, no one is particularly forthcoming about different things that countries ask for, but, um, but we know some of it did happen. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, which is popularly called the Ban Treaty, is a treaty that was negotiated in 2017, mainly, well, all by non-nuclear weapon states. So no nuclear weapon states participated in the negotiations or voted for the, the final treaty text. This is a treaty that came about as a result of an initiative that started in the early 2010s um, by certain states and by disarmament advocates to focus on the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons. And so these, folk, these folks were arguing that for so long, um, discussions about nuclear weapons had been left to the nuclear weapon states and particularly to, to a few individuals in each state, right? That those with um, security clearances who are making these decisions about nuclear posture and nuclear use, declaratory policy. 
And that all those discussions, whether it's about deterrence or extended deterrence or strategic stability, um, does not acknowledge the devastating humanitarian effects that these weapons can have. And so they wanted to bring that discourse back into the conversation. And so um, we see the first conference related to the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons in early 2013. It was, it was held in Oslo, Norway. Um, they brought several experts in to talk about the effects of nuclear testing, of radiation on bodies, how it um, how a nuclear detonation could affect you know, the economy or the climate. They also brought victims of nuclear testing, so people who had been downwinders, say, in New Mexico, or people in the Marshall Islands, or um, in Australia, in Kazakhstan, uh, in Japan. Of course, in Japan, it's not testing, it's nuclear use. But any kind of victims of radiation from nuclear weapons were invited to give testimony, too, to talk about uh, their experience. And, and I think it's interesting, because they acknowledge it these people are experts too in kind of knowing what the effects of nuclear weapons are. So anyway, so there was a conference in Oslo, the five official nuclear weapon states in the MPT together boycotted that conference. They put um, a public release out, uh, a one page document explaining that they thought that this kind of conference would distract from the MPT and from other efforts to deal with nuclear weapons. Um, there was another conference, similar conference in Mexico. Uh, and then the final one was in Vienna in uh, December of 2014. And from, I was not at these conferences. I've interviewed a lot of people who are there. Uh, from talking to people, these conferences really helped teach a lot of diplomats from non-nuclear weapon states about the effects of nuclear weapons. It was an issue maybe many of them hadn't covered before or didn't have in their portfolios. And so it really helped build momentum to do something about nuclear weapons. And over the course of time, um, there had been something called the Nuclear Weapons Convention, which had been written um, first in 1997 and then 2007. It was a long and detailed treaty. And at some point, um, the kind of individuals from states and advocacy organizations who were spearheading this effort decided to move forward with what was considered a simple ban treaty. It doesn't have verification protocols, that will come later, um, but it's, it's a short, I think it's 10 or 11 page treaty that bans anything to do with nuclear weapons, right? So you can't station them on your soil. You can't help another country build them. You can't threaten their use. And so to me, that means you, you, know, you can't engage in nuclear deterrence because you can't um, threaten any kind of retaliation with nuclear weapons. Um, and so, as I said, that was negotiated over 2017. Um, 122 states voted to adopt the treaty. It will enter into force when 50 states have ratified it. Um, and to date, where we are in early September, 44 states um, have ratified the treaty. So they don't need that many more until it enter, will enter into force. Both the Obama and Trump administration were against this treaty. Um, I've written about how I think it's unfortunate that the US has been so negative and so pejorative about the treaty and the people behind it. And that I hope in the future, the US government um, even if it doesn't want to go along with this treaty, and I don't think it will, um, but that they can, there, there can be some effort to find more common ground. Because um, if you think about it, if you have a bunch of countries learning that nuclear weapons are terrible, then that has a proliferation effect or non-proliferation positive effect too, which is something the U.S. cares a lot about. So I don't, I don't think this is all bad for the U.S. Um, uh, but we'll see. I, I will, it'll be interesting to see how the nuclear weapon states respond to entry into force. I mean, I think on balance, nuclear urban states think that the, it is negative overall. And it is because if the treaty is trying to stigmatize the possession of nuclear weapons, so it's trying to create a norm that it is wrong, that is inappropriate uh, to have possession of these nuclear weapons. So if you imagine if that norm spreads and societies all over the world think that it's not okay to have nuclear weapons, then the theory of change here would be that then those publics put pressure on their governments through elections or um, just through public opinion not to have nuclear weapons. And the U.S. relies, I mean, according to its national security documents, the U.S. relies on nuclear deterrence for its security. And so I think the real fear is that the public will become galvanized behind this treaty and will um, put pressure on the U.S. to potentially disarm. And then you hear a common um, criticism is that, 
people against the treaty think that democracies are going to be more susceptible to that public pressure than autocracies. So they say, oh, great, you're making the world safe for Russia and North Korea and China to have these weapons, and yet the West will disarm. Um, I don't think that would happen, but I think I, I see I see that concern or expressing that concern is is really about we're worried that somehow someone's going to make the argument that we need to get rid of our deterrent and that the U.S., at least in the current in the Trump administration, um, talks about that we can't pursue disarmament until our security circumstances improve. Um, so representatives of the Trump administration have, have said, we can't go any lower. We've done negotiations with the Russians. You know, we have the New START Treaty. Um, we can't go lower than the limits established there until the security environment improves. So it's a very different norm or it's a very different idea that you can't disarm until you have the right security environment versus these are just, these weapons are, are wrong to possess regardless of the security environment. And I think those are the two norms that are kind of at loggerheads here. Um, and one thing I think that's interesting about that is if you take the security idea that you can only get rid of these when security improves, you know, security improves and then gets worse. And we saw that, you know, the nineties, we thought security had improved. Now we're potentially entering this period of great power competition. That means disarmament would potentially not be very permanent. And so what would that look like? If you say we can get rid of these weapons because we're in this better security environment today, but 20 years from now we're not. So we rebuild them and that, that, that's problematic. So um, I, I don't necessarily see the, the method of disarmament that relies on improvement to security um, seems less sustainable than one that would, that would be based on a strong norm. Of course, norms can change too. Um, but I, I think it's interesting to think what's the end game of a security argument versus this normative argument. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's an obvious question to ask about the Obama administration because of the Prague speech that President Obama gave, which was uh, a much heralded speech in which he uh, set out a vision for a world without nuclear weapons. Um, he did also say, not in his lifetime probably, he also said as long as they exist, the U.S. would have, a, uh, I think it's safe, secure, and effective arsenal. So he was, not, he was not setting out a vision that was some kind of rapid disarmament. But I, nonetheless, I still think that there was sort of a surprise. Um, and so from my understanding is that there was an interagency process in the Obama administration about whether the U.S. should participate in those humanitarian conferences I mentioned, um, and that there were those um, in certain agencies, which you can imagine were who were um, very much arguing in favor for showing up, telling the U.S. narrative, um, and kind of making our arguments, making U.S. arguments. Um, and then there was another uh, contingency that just thought we shouldn't legitimize it by showing up at all. And so that, that, that latter contingency won out for the first two conferences, and then um, the U.S. did send representatives to the final one in Vienna. At that point, I think it was, it was kind of too late to really shape anything. I think... Um, there was a, a good amount of momentum there towards pursuing the ban. And so, I mean, I think the, the Obama administration did try to pursue more arms control. So if you remember a new start, which was the, the only arms control treaty that they got was supposed to be a first step. Um, and there was a vision for, for more, um, but there, it was, they had such a hard time getting the Senate to agree um, to ratify new start and how it was so difficult that that, that plan quickly um, they realized that that wasn't going to work now in 2013 president obama did say that the u.s was willing to go down to a thousand um i assume that meant deployed nuclear weapons um strategic deployed um if if the partner on the other side if russia was willing to go along and russia wasn't and so it's it's not for a lack of trying i think i think if both the senate and russia had been maybe more amenable there was the Obama administration certainly had an appetite uh, for more reductions, but I think Obama setting out that vision for a world without nuclear weapons is, is an important vision. Um, of course, it's in the MPT. So when everyone said it was just this big deal that he was saying that, he was like, well, the U.S. has been committed to that since ratifying the MPT, um, at least in Article 6. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see uh, if President, um, if Vice President Biden wins how how does he continue that legacy that they started um, towards at least reductions?
Yeah, I think when the Trump administration first came out and said, we're not going to extend New START until we can get China there at the table, that many people were skeptical and thought, oh, he's just trying to kill arms control because, you know, conventional wisdom is, of course, China, they have so, so many fewer nuclear weapons that why would they want to join that agreement? Um, I, of course, that's not to say that there isn't going to come a time when it needs to be multilateralized. I just don't know that this next step is the right step. Um, I, I think both in arms control ag agreements and with the broader nuclear nonproliferation regime, I think the U.S. should be working more to socialize China to kind of what is involved in, in playing the role that the U.S. has played in the past 50 years. Um, how are U.S. good steward of the nuclear nonproliferation regime? What does that mean day, day to day? I mean, I've just been so amazed when looking back at the historical record of these cables. I mean, there were people cabling every day about getting countries in the MPT, every day about countries joining certain agreements. I mean, this is a painstaking work. And so um, I don't know that as China rises, as, at this point, if China is kind of ready to be in that role. And so I think the, as much as the US, and maybe this is something that can be done in the P5, there's an MPT P5 process that was started in 2009, where the P5, the five nuclear weapon states um, get together and try to talk about the MPT and there's hope there that they can increase transparency amongst those countries. And so I think that would be a good mechanism to better leverage for this kind of thing. But yeah, I think it's, it's very easy to see China's perspective that they have so many fewer, why would they wanna join at this particular time and that the US and Russia need to come down much more. Um, but you know, if China's in, then France and Great Britain are soon in as well. Yeah, we are in a very normatively complex time and it's really hard to, I mean, norms are hard to study anyway from the perspective of, you know, we would like to know how entrenched the taboo is in every country in the world. And another way of saying that is how much does that taboo factor into constraining state behavior, right? And and we don't have a great answer to that. Um, I think um, there's new research suggesting that the American public doesn't actually have the taboo, and then there's research countering that saying, well, no, th 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 we do have the taboo entrenched here. Um, and so, yeah, I think what we're seeing is we've had this, we had this global movement for disarmament um, that's, you know, wants a taboo, the taboo, the taboo against first use essentially, but also the taboo against testing, um, the taboo, and, and to develop a taboo against um, possession. And at the same time, strategic circumstances uh, uh, that the U.S. is facing is making U.S. leaders um, more interested in thinking about nuclear weapons for deterrence and thinking about lower yield nuclear weapons and ha having escalation dominance at lower levels, um, really Cold War kind of things, um, or things that most people haven't thought about till the Cold War, of course, the Department of Defense has. Um, and so, yeah, this kind of, I mean, it's too simple to say norms versus security because there are norms of security uh, but you do see this kind of pitting against each other and how it will end up i mean i've wondered myself and thought about how how would it even how would it come to be that a majority of populations or even a big enough critical mass of populations would would pursue this norm uh, or buy into this norm and and to me we we live in such a complicated and complex modern world and it's it's made me think how how do the how does the public have time to think about this you know i mean there is this is a little up to, off topic but with the pandemic there was an article today that one out of 8 americans are hungry and so i wouldn't expect any of those one out of 8 to spend time thinking about nuclear disarmament or climate change or any of the challenges that we face where we really need global cooperation and so um I don't know how i'm going to research this but i think this is an area that i, I think more that i like to think about is just public getting the public involved. And I think if the public is involved, it will be a determinator in policy, but it's just not so involved right now. So hard, hard question there.